Zverein. Uh, he uh, studied economics and sociology and holds a doctorate degree in sociology from the State University of New York. In 2005, he operated as a coordinator of the rewriting Maritime History of Ottoman Empire project. And uh, 2007, he won the uh, EAP Cup Prize of the European Association of Evolution, uh, Evolutionary Political Economy. He was, until recently, professor in the Department of Economics of the Middle East Technical University in Ankara. And now he is an uh, independent scholar in Istanbul. And uh, Giga Zedani, in his uh, brilliant introduction, uh, mentioned him in one breath with uh, Fernand Brodel and uh, Georges Bratiano, which I think is absolutely no exaggeration, because Eub Özveren uh, made uh, groundbreaking studies of understanding Black Sea as a one space as a unified space in his uh, 20 years old article now, a framework of the study of the Black Sea world between 1798 uh, and 1915. And uh, I remember his absolutely brilliant talk on our uh, Black Sea conference last year in Batumi, revisit uh, to the Black Sea world and the port cities in comparative perspective. So now we have comparative perspective Mm, not from the literature, literary uh, perspective proper, but a comparative perspective which, is, which aims to reconstruct uh, Black Sea as a unified region uh, through literature and through arts, so music, architecture, uh, painting, uh, and a great deal of other things. Uh, Professor Özveren, I am very glad to welcome you here in Tbilisi, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to your talk, Black Sea, a Sea of literary, literary and Cultural Distinction. Thank you very much uh, for this uh, introduction, which usually embarrasses me raises the expectations so high that it is somewhat difficult to measure up to them. Uh, I want to start... Okay. Um, I want to start uh, by confessing a truth. Uh, we have these two presentations, mine just after the first one. The first presentation was impressive indeed. And I want you to hold in your mind the fact that the very literature to which uh, the speaker refers has always been a source of inspiration for me as well. Uh, Benjamin, Glissard, uh, and uh, other uh, Madris, Zebal. Uh, I'm not going to talk about those things, uh, but they occupy half of my life as a time, so obviously they will have some reflection in thinking out what I'm saying. But what I'm do, going to do today is going to be a kind of archaeology or a metaphorical fieldwork type of approach to Black Sea on the basis of my past work in social sciences, economic history and so forth. Uh, so it's taking another course but with a background which is 60% uh, perhaps uh, uh, matter covered in the first. Now, I have a whole list of slides, but I will go through them very quickly, so I will try to bear your interest alive in the course of this presentation. Now, this is the map of the Black Sea, just to remind ourselves. And the one point that I want to emphasize is that uh, it's literally a map of the littoral, that is the coastline, the circumference of the Black Sea. And this is what we take for granted because it's defined as a locality in relation with the sea, which is at its center. However, I use a different term. I refer to Black Sea World. And what I mean is a greater territory, geography, space to which 
something radiates from the center. This we should keep in mind. Obviously, the Black Sea world is larger than the Black Sea and it's literal. This raises the question of how much larger and this concerns the drawing of fuzzy boundaries. Now, the very use of the term world also suggests that there is a connection with the Mediterranean world of Vernon Brodel and that is at the back of my mind, obviously. There's a treatment of this Black Sea world as an extension and backwater as a world in its own right as an alternative to the first. The first and perhaps the most poignant person who did this uh, was the interwar Romanian historian, George Bratianu, who wrote something smaller than, but certainly in a way comparable to that of Brodel's Mediterranean, but with respect to the Black Sea. And he has been a source of inspiration for me as well. Now, in my title, I refer to distinction, and I need to clarify that. First of all, Black Sea as an extension of the Mediterranean thesis is very widespread. It's the dominant approach. We see it in Brodel, Matveyevich, Horton and Purcell, Abu Lafia and who else? There is, of course, a distinction of the Black Sea vis-à-vis -vis the Mediterranean. This intrigues many a mind. Physically, geologically, it's different in its prehistorical formation. That's the domain of the scientists. At the same time, this sea has been remade, and by humans, through cultural connections that made Black Sea a part of the Mediterranean. I refer here to all kinds of transgressions ever since the ancient ones initiated by the Greeks, but which have continued again in 19th century, 20th century, and perhaps even now. I also want to bring to your attention a literary distinction. Mediterranean is a domain that's noted for its convergence of languages, their crisscrossings, literatures, and literary scholarship traditions. This is to do with the fact that languages are traceable to certain families, and they have had stronger common denominators within those families, and therefore, uh, those uh, at least grouping these literatures and studying them jointly has become quite common. Latin-based, Greek-based, later Arabic-based, and so forth, studies, literary traditions. Black Sea is a difficult task. It has many structurally different languages and literary traditions thereof. So there exists no generalist literary scholarship to see beyond the local and the national. Local and national are not always obviously the same thing, they are different. The lacunae concerning the Black Sea literature further is overshadowed by the overwhelming modern Russian literature which has attracted the attention of those who want to study literature as national histories of traditions. And the Russian literature of the 19th century was certainly a very strong candidate for attracting this attention, as we will see in a minute. Now, Black Sea also occupied a distinct place as a subject in literature. It was in ancient literature, and then it's again in modern literature. We know that many people wrote about it. They traveled, they wrote things. So it's somehow diffused into our general knowledge of literature without always our being conscious of the fact that it is traceable to Black Sea and Black Sea left an important print mark on this connection. Now, what I do in this presentation, or rather in this paper that I'm writing, uh, which is much longer than what is, uh, I will present, uh, is uh, the following. I will just uh, give you some clues about it. I'm not concerned with either literary classics or canonical literature. 
all the alleged literary word value of text. This is not my concern. I choose texts that are useful to illustrate or substantiate my thesis concerning the Black Sea world. We are concerned here with the representative power of the text and or the geographical and ethnographic material they provide for our understanding Black Sea world better in the sense of a social scientist. We limit our presentation here to fiction and within fiction to novel and this is for entirely practical reasons to save time and to focus clearly. <coughs> now there are really three works I take as points of departure to illustrate points. One is by Jules Verne, Kereban Le Tetu. It's a grand tour of the literal. It traces clockwise the entire circumference of the Black Sea by virtue of an anecdote. And it emphasizes elements that I will perhaps point out in a later slide that are traceable to an international republic of letters. The second text is by Lev Tolstoy. It is one of his uh, last pieces and it was posthumously published. It's a novella. It's Haji Murad. And I use this because it involves a middle range excursion from the literal to the immediate highlands. I had another choice which was an excursion to the steppe, but I decided not to do it for reasons including the fact that we are more or less in that part of the world uh, which is to do with the highlands and the mountains. And it also forms a connection with the third world. Now, the point that I want to underline in Tolstoy's small uh, text, short text, but very important text, is that this Black Sea world is represented as worlds apart, which is subject to forceful center-periphery interaction between an imperial expanding center and the frontier, which is on the move, but subject to incorporation into this domain. The third book that I use is by Genghis Aitmatov, 1970. It's The White Ship. The Black Sea world is much greater than the geographical Black Sea literal. This book goes even further. It presents us with a space, somewhat blurred, but at the same time important. The time scope is longer than what is usually taken for granted. We are no longer in early modern or modern period. In fact, it takes us all the way back to what is called deep time, that echoes in space and ethnographic and legendary evidence, as well as literary intuition and imagery that attest to the complex reality that is this fuzzy largest expression of the so-called Black Sea world. Now, we know Jules Verne. He's the most popular, perhaps the most widely translated and read novelist uh, in the minds of many who are not specialists in literature uh, because his books are uh, written in several versions afterwards to the uh, public attention. He traveled a lot. He made many travels. He had a boat himself. But importantly in 1878 he toured the Mediterranean and then again in 1884, he made an even more detailed tour around the Mediterranean. The reason why I single out these two tours is that the book Kereban Le Tetu came out just shortly before uh, the second tour. Uh, and my impression is probably, in a sense, he toured and experienced the Mediterranean but then wrote an imaginary book about the Black Sea circumference, the literal. Uh, it's uh, based on an adventure, which is like a travelogue. Now, for I'm not going through all the points, as I said, 
Geography was a passion as well as a field of specialization for Van. The genre of Roman Geographic was an alternative to historical novel uh, in the sense of Alexander Dumas, but also Walter Scott and so forth. Uh, and uh, it was an adventure novel intended to transmit state-of-the-art geography of the time to public knowledge. In this of geographical novel, contemporary stories unravel in distant places, hence there is room for expression of the ethnographic element in detail, which I find of value for my own purpose. Now, the story traces the literal, except for one before the last scene where the action moves to inland Anatolia temporarily. Istanbul is in the beginning as well as at the end. It dominates the Black Sea and controls it by way of the Bosphorus. Its two rival sites, as expressed in the novel, are Odessa, business-wise complementary and new in the 19th century, and Trebizond, which is represented as menacing and ancient at the same time. It doesn't matter much which of these two cities belongs to which empire, including uh, Istanbul. I, I refer to Odessa and Istanbul, sorry, here. Uh, for the reason that in the novel, the frontier or the border between the two empires is not of great significance. Empires hardly control this broader geography which prevails over them. Offstage are, in this novel again, uh, Rotterdam-centric Holland on the one end and Mussel-centric Kurdistan on the other. It defines a certain territory for us. Uh, Malta and Mediterranean are also placed off stage in the presentation. Main characters are Caravan, obviously, a Galata-based tobacco dealer who is presented as un véritable Osmanli, un fidèle de ce parti de vieux turc. But it's very interesting, I skip to the second point. Characters, including that of Caravan, are strongly differentiated by traits, yet their ethno-religious attributes are blurred. They belong to a pre-modern cosmopolitan world. The choice of unusual names, such as Caravan, also contributes to this effect. Pious Caravan bears the common character traits of Ottoman Muslim, as well as Armenian long-distance merchants typical of the 17th to mid-19th century Black Sea trade. I exclude the Greek merchants here because they had another trade which doesn't exactly overlap with that of Armenian and uh, Turkish Ottoman merchants of the same period, which is that uh, the Greeks were at the same time ship owners, shippers or ship captains, uh, whereas the others were hiring vessels to do this business largely and they combined uh, a strong element of overland trade, uh, unlike the Greeks who did much of the overseas trade. Now, in addition to Caravan, uh, there, is, uh, there are other characters. Uh, these characters are represented. They are connected with uh, tobacco trade and uh, largely uh, they travel with their servants and make a uh, clockwise tour. The reason why this whole story takes place is that Caravan, as a stubborn merchant, refuses to pay a new tax placed on crossing the Bosphorus on his way from his work to his home in Scutari. To avoid this tax, he decides to tour over land so that he would not have to cross the Bosphorus. And the adventure is just given a pretext uh, to occur. Uh, and uh, this is the story, and then there's an adventure line, not only the trouble itself, but also the fact that uh, Caravan's uh, niece is supposed to get married uh, to the daughter of his banker connection in Odessa, and that marriage has to take place within a short interval of time. However, uh, at the same time, a uh, strong notable of Trebizond has an eye on her and hires a Maltese captain to uh, hijack her uh, 
uh, to Trapezon uh, to her uh, so that uh, she would join his harem. Uh, this is the storyline. So there is nothing of literary value in the classical sense uh, to identify here. And then uh, a strong coincidence occurs when uh, Caravan and his company happen to be passing by when the ship within which uh, the uh, would-be bride Amasya is uh, kidnapped, uh, is subject to a shipwreck, so uh, Ahmed sails, uh, swims uh, off the coast of Trebizond, saves her, and then they go through further uh, succession of uh, plots, events, etc., uh, to make it to Skutari shortly before the deadline, so everything comes to a good ending. Now, I will just emphasize a few of the uh, literary attributes. For example, the very beginning of the book is very interesting. Uh, in fact, uh, it takes place in exactly the quarter of Istanbul where I and my family live now. Uh, but when I started this project, it wasn't so. Uh, it's uh, the Dutch uh, Van Mitten and his servant arrive in Istanbul on a day uh, and uh, Van describes it uh, as they see it. Uh, there's no movement. Uh, it's spectacular, but there's no movement. And so there's the question, uh, where are all these people who we have learned exist and populate this vast metropolitan city? And this is actually mimicking of a few of the fantastic tales that are in uh, Thousand and One Nights. Uh, but in Thousand and One Nights, uh, this kind of place which is devoid of humans and action is traceable to fantastic explanations occasionally. Uh, here it appears fantastic but it is traceable to a real down-to-earth reason which is it's the month of Ramadan, these people don't know it and during the daytime everybody is feasting and then Van allows the stage to be animated after the sunset when everybody is out there in the streets. So this literary connection I find interesting, but there is also an important ending. Ending takes place amidst an extraordinary spectacle on the Bosphorus, where Caravan takes the place of the partner of an Italian acrobat to cross the Bosphorus without paying the tax to get to the European side this time. So there's a whole spectacle, the spectacle is uh, on the sea, and they take part in that spectacle and use it uh, as a way of uh, escaping this legal binding tax. Now, again, there is much ethnographically important in this whole description. Uh, the Maltese Tartane is uh, represented as a bazaar flottant. Uh, it has a whole cargo which represents all the places that traded in this domain to lure uh, this uh, would-be bride, Amasya. Uh, and then uh, the, the novel itself is an interplay of different genres, uh, and it's noted for its self-reflexive theatricality. It refers to theater as a metaphor in many instances, and is quite polyphonic, with Verne incorporating certain occasionally wrong uh, local language uh, quotations into the text. The spectacle in the end, as well as its prefiguration during the engagement ceremony in Trebizond, enhanced the inherent theatricality of the novel. This is part and parcel of the carnivalesque with which the narration is infused. The common linear storyline of the adventure story thus advances through an otherwise chaotic, little-known geographical environment. That everyone participates in this process, including Verne himself, and I give certain examples here, which you might see, uh, along with his local language insertions, conversion of local money and measures, tributes to Gautier, Lord Byron, Ferdinand de Lesseps, and there exists a final resolution at the end, 
All these give the impression of a functioning international republic of letters in which everyone has a role to play. <coughs> this is the way it is. Now, this is the adventure of business-minding merchants and not born travelers or explorers. This odyssey is forced upon them by the nature of the plot. These marble strangers are nevertheless hard-pressed by the deadline and cannot afford to see ancient ruins they have much heard of and so forth. But there is this element uh, behind the whole story and Van occasionally gives us touches of that historical background. Now the representation of the Black Sea is a danger infected and unpredictable sea, difficult to cross. According to the calculations he presents, it would take about three weeks to sail from Odessa uh, to Trebizond. Okay. Now, it's a commercial sea where even danger is expressed in the quoted price, as Yarhut puts it. Uh, it simply affects how much you have to pay for something. It's also a tripolar sea with major ports in the corners, Istanbul, Odessa, Trebizond. With Odessa, with all its splendor, as a ville commerçante, distinguished by its merchants and bankers on the rise, and Trebizond, port of transit trade, on decline, the unlikely impossible guess of destination of the Tartane, as well as a city deserving a place in history. Black Sea is represented as a theater stage, and with the ending, the Bosphorus as the theater stage par excellence. Verne also puts Black Sea in perspective. There are several curses, uh, like the first ones I quote, but there's also a conversation between Van Mitten and Keraban, uh, in which a comparison is made between uh, the ocean and the Black Sea, and where Van Mitten refers to the Black Sea as a lake in comparison with the ocean, which offends Keraban vastly. But this also, of course, gives us an indication of the true nature of Black Sea, which is not immediately discernible to the natives of the time, who saw it as the vast and possibly one of the most important seas in the world of the time. Now, there's a clockwise itinerary described. He lists all the countries as well as territories through which the trip has to uh, pass through. And he estimates that this, this would take no less than 45 days. Compared with 21 days, this of course means that the seaborne traffic has a great advantage even under worse circumstances. Three weeks as opposed to 45 days, which can be sufficient to complete under normal circumstances an overland tour of the region. It offers us a counterfactual proof of Istanbul's important role. This absurd voyage is uneconomic, but not an impossible substitution. And it implies something for us. What if Bosphorus did not exist as a yoke on the Black Sea? The alternative itinerary reveals the Black Sea as a literal based, lake encircling, more disparate world of the many in which Istanbul would have no special role. Black Sea as a world exists by virtue of the Bosphorus on which Istanbul has had an exceptional role derivative of her hegemony. Istanbul is constitutive of the Black Sea, whereas its rivals Trebizond and Odessa are beneficiaries of it. This is a truth that can be discerned in Verne's description but it's a lesson of history in the broader sense to those accustomed with the literature. Then there's also an attack on this monopoly function of Istanbul, and he says, uh, uh, this quotation you can read quickly. And then I use this uh, to pass over to the next novel. This is where actually, for the last before the the one before the last scene, they take a turn away from the littoral to the inland and then from where they will proceed to Skudari on the Asian coast. And we will take a turn together with them, but not uh, continue. We will rather go in a different uh, direction through Tolstoy to the highlands. 
Now, Tolstoy, of course, was uh, related with this region as early as the 50s, uh, from which some of his earliest work emerged. And then he became famous for the other novels we know. But uh, Haji Murat uh, was the last thing that he wrote, uh, again, returning to other things. Now, this story takes place in 1851-52, precisely as he dates it. Uh, in mountain villages, fortresses, borderlands in Chechnya, Vedeno, Grozny, Dagestan, the Caucasus, Tiflis, the provincial capital, and imperial capital, Petersburg. Central character is Haji Murad. Uh, he's the devil, the brave Sigid, extraordinary warrior, the bravest of Shamian's lieutenants, and his few murids, but also people surrounding them on both the uh, local side as well as on the Russian side. These people are not stereotypes, but highly differentiated characters with psychological depth who evolve in reaction to circumstances. Tolstoy, the elderly author, whose memory is triggered and narrates the story as well as giving it a mature and humane touch, also plays an active role. He involves himself as in the framing story. Now, uh, the story is about Haji Murad, uh, who switches sides because he has a quarrel with Imam Shamil, shifts to the Russians, but he's not trusted by either of the sides. And uh, then he has a family which is taken as hostage by Shamil and his men, and he sees that Russians will not be uh, involved in liberating his family, so he has to take the matter to his own hands. He decides to escape uh, from the Russians and launch a hopeless attack with a few men on Shami's stronghold, searching his way through the river to the forest. Their horses get trapped in the flooded rice fields, and he's hunted brutally like a beast by his enemies, Russian or otherwise. Now, the beginning of the story is by a flashback. Uh, Tolstoy refers to himself as collecting flowers in the countryside, and he comes across a thistle, a tartar, uh, which he tries to pick, fails, uh, then succeeds, but then the thistle is destroyed, and then further back down his road home, he sees uh, a field where plowing had been done, then again he sees a tartar, the very same uh, kind of flower, uh, and uh, it had been run over by a wheel, but uh, resisted, and so forth. Uh, as if a piece of its flesh had been ripped away, its guts turned inside out, an arm torn off, an eye blinded, but it still stands and does not surrender to man who has annihilated all its brothers around it. What energy, I thought. Man has conquered everything, destroyed millions of plants, but this one still doesn't surrender. And then he says, this reminds him in his old age of a story of an experience in Caucasus and goes back to the 50s and tells about everything. And at the very end, when he recounts the assassination of Haji Murad, uh, he says, this was the death I was reminded of by the crush thistle in the midst of the plowed field. Now, we obviously have a time constraint, so I will try to go a little bit faster uh, and uh, cover it. <laughs> First of all, this is a story uh, told by an uncommon economy of narration with sideline stories that cast a light on the main storyline. It is full of cinematic techniques, flashback, cross-cutting, close-up, face, head focuses. It involves descriptions with a few strokes, Historical events retold by recourse to witnesses and documents, psychological depth of characters as befitting the classical novel form, but it also has a multilinguistic polyphony of narration with a background soundtrack. This also reminds one of the storytelling, uh, as in the case of Knights, it's where Constant self-reflexive references are made to storytelling. People tell their stories, they report their stories or other stories. Uh, Haji Murad himself remembers a Tavlinian tale about a falcon and so forth. 
which sort of prefigures what will happen to him. Uh, and uh, even the end of Murat is told as the ultimate uh, disgusting story, but then Tolstoy still tells his other story at the end of it. So uh, this is again in the very same tradition of story within tradition within so forth. But folk songs, by virtue of the geography that is involved, also tell stories and provide another leitmotiv. Within the soundtrack, folk songs come to the foreground, reach a crescendo, and ultimately yield to the nightingales in the ending. Songs are representative of the cyclical repetition characteristic of local life, but also prophetic as a prefiguration of Murat's destiny. And then the quotation is again one of those instances which uh, deserve analysis. These are all uses of songs in very different places as a tragicomic counterpoint also, but also at the very end. Now, this is about shifting boundaries all the time, and it is about ethnographic depth at the same time. In this very tiny novel of some hundred pages, we have all these descriptions of individuals, classifications, Avar, Chechen, Cossack, Armenian, Kumik, uh, Italian, uh, and so forth, Lesbian, a Jew, uh, in many different ways, sometimes uh, summoned together as crowd of mountaineers, natives, and so forth. Custom and tradition are law. There are instances of that presented repeatedly in the text itself and uh, these are uh, covered. There's a kind of cultural re relativism uh, to which uh, Tolstoy approaches sympathetically. Um, Murat is said to comment at the end of uh, visit to Tiflis uh, on the theater and ball which uh, he visited. Every people has its own customs, every people finds its own customs good. So this is the summary statement of the thing. Now, there is the crossing the border of identity and difference. Uh, these characters who are identified as Russians, Tartar, and so forth occasionally uh, venture into the domain beyond that. And uh, the most expressive one uh, is the anti-war proclamation, but also very humane, uh, made by Maria, the character. Having seen Murat's chopped head, Maria you are all butchers, I can't bear it. Real butchers, she said, get it up. The same could happen to anyone, said Butler, not knowing what to say. That's war. War, cried Maria Dimitrievna. What war? You're butchers, that's all. At that point, it should be in the ground, and they just cheer, real butchers. This is the extreme expression used in the novel as a proclamation uh, of uh, philosophy against uh, ongoing ethnic uh, cleansing in the mountains. There's the crossing of the border of the imaginary and the real, because many people know about Haji Murad through stories, then they see him as real. But the order of presentation in the novel is otherwise. The readers uh, first know who Haji Murad is, and then they see uh, the stories, they hear the stories about him. Uh, and at the very end of it, again, there's the crossing of the border of body and soul as death comes, and this is a description with a surgical precision of scientific detail that uh, Tolstoy develops. Tolstoy intervenes like uh, Van uh, in many instances in the story, uh, includes uh, commentaries and so forth. Uh, intermingling of words from various languages, uh, people use these words in the text. Uh, so much so that there is a special glossary added at the back. Now, there's a critical issue about language, which is uh, on the Russian side, uh, people often speak <laughs> French uh, and so forth in addition to Russian. They communicate informally among themselves in Russian, which they find easier, the nobility, the aristocracy. and. Uh, uh, among the natives, Tart uh, is a widespread second best language among ethnicities. Uh, it's the one used by Haji Murat, who is 
and Avar, uh, but uh, when it comes to... And this Tatar is also uh, learned, spoken by Russians who are on the field to some extent, uh, and they follow it. Now, there are several instances of what one would, uh, following uh, people uh, who are specialists in this, uh, call language games. People say one thing, but what's taking place as communication is quite a different thing at the back. Or, th there are important silences in the novel uh, when people do not speak, but by not speaking they express something. There are instances of this, and occasionally on both sides, the politically powerful people, uh, the Tsar and Imam Shamil, not Haji Murad, silent, when they are silent, they occasionally communicate with the divine, take orders of what should be done, so to speak, given inspiration. Now, uh, in the text, there's an indication of the verticality, here, hierarchy, and inequality thereof. The Voronsovs uh, are represented uh, of course, uh, the elder Boron so, uh, is an important figure, but he also uh, is uh, uh, already spending the greater part of his means on the construction of a palace and garden on the southern coast of Crimea. Uh, there is hierarchy and inequality. His son, the younger Boron so, lives in a fortress. Uh, but uh, the natives think uh, that that's extraordinary luxury, whereas in fact he and his wife consider this a modest life, but beyond that one filled with privation. And uh, again, uh, this, this kind of uh, expression we get everywhere. Now, Caucasus is treated as Poland on the opposite side, from uh, the politics of uh, Imperial Russia, and uh, they are two headaches as uh, represented in the novel. Finally, the affair of Haji Murat is switching uh, sides and what is of a life and death importance for him, is also treated as an insignificant affair in the numbering of the dossiers, the files waiting for treatment on the Tsar's table as well as Imam Shamil's on his return from the campaign. Uh, so this is the most important story for the family, for the locality and so forth, but at the same time for those who are politically potent it is treated as one among the many <coughs> irrespective of its own importance. There is alienation but also human sameness and there is also disproportionality. Uh, these are uh, very important themes in the mastery of the narrative. Now, this is one of the strong uh, treatments towards the end. All the heads of households gathered on the square and squatting down discussed their situation. Of hatred for the Russians, no one even spoke. The feeling that was experienced by all the Chechens, big and small, was stronger than hatred. It was not hatred but the refusal to recognize these Russian dogs as human beings and such loathing, disgust and bewilderment before the absurd cruelty of these beings that the wish to exterminate them like the wish to exterminate rats, venomous spiders and wolves was as natural as the sense of self-preservation. But this idea of self-preservation is very importantly emphasized. Geography is treated as wilderness but also as nature that uh, molds the character of the people, and there are instances of this uh, which I single out. Nature is also environment subject to destruction, and this links the inner story with the framing story to which I referred. Uh, the plan moving forward gradually, though slowly cutting down forests, destroying provisions, the Caucasus would have been subjugated long ago. And this is what they revived in the 50s, uh, again, restricting the mountaineers by cutting down the forest and a system of fortifications extended and so forth. Uh, this is continuously what is taking place. Environmental destruction is important. Now I come to the last text, uh, which I will go even more rapidly through, uh, if the chair would allow me for another 10 minutes. Now, this is by Aitmatov, the Kyrgyz uh, writer. Uh, 
He wrote in Russian and Kyrgyz, was bilingual and bicultural, wrote play stories and novels. He combined traditional Russian realism with a magic surreality to do with the lore and poetic landscape characteristic of Kyrgyzstan that he evoked. Widely translated into some 150 languages, he became a very important cultural uh, figure. His movies, uh, his uh, novels were, stories were uh, made into uh, movies as well. He was son of a victim of Stalin's purges, yet paradoxically became the most decorated Soviet writer of the time as well. Uh, he wrote in both languages and finally served as Kyrgyz ambassador after the dismemberment of the USSR. Now, the white ship uh, takes place in a very small village on the verge of mountains and in the heart of nature with the school in a far from easily commuting distance. Characters are locals as well as strangers, intruders. There's a child who is the major character. Uh, he's abandoned by parents who are divorced and migrated away. He lives with grandpa and uh, who takes care of him. And there are a few other people like the locally despotic Oros, cool, the forest guard and uh, people who inhabit, but uh, animals of the family are almost like characters. They play more or less similar roles. Uh, the story is about uh, a specific, uh, it, well, it concentrates on a particular day for the resolution of the course it will take. This is a day uh, when Oroskul, the forest guard, abuses the grandpa, but at the same time it's the very day that uh, legendary deers have made reappearance in the place so the grandfather considers it a very special day indeed uh, and on that day his abusal hurts him very badly he revolts he takes the horse of Oroskus uh, to go to the school to take the grandchild but this stirs a chain of events uh, which ultimately lead to destruction this is again about storytelling uh, it's about two tales one, the tale of the child who nobody knew, and the other was what he heard from his grandfather. And uh, in the introduction, Aitmato says uh, he will speak of them as the story. The child is a storyteller who cannot tell his story. The grandfather is a storyteller, and the author also is a storyteller who tells stories within stories, and now has the next and possible the final word to say. Uh, now, the book has really two potential alternative endings. One is worldly, via the Kudubek driver as movie like Savior. The other, the ancestral, epical, and deadly ending via the white ship. The two tales, which are in the heart of the story, clash and determine which ending will prevail, and this becomes obvious in the assessment in the end. Uh, the child chooses to swim away. He did not wait for Kulubek, the savior's arrival, but then uh, Aitmatov has a commenting on that. Uh, the White Ship is a very interesting book in the sense that in addition to other characters, There is interaction with rocks, trees, weeds, dogs, school bag, everything. It's like Andre Bielis Petersburg in a sense, but nature is far more interactive than the urban landscape here. Conceived less fantastic and normal, personification and animation of objects, even the advance of autumn in nature, the sun or the receding of nature with civilization are told as actions uh, in a uh, humanely spirited way. Uh, story unfolds in a legendary yet real landscape at a time when caravans of the Silk Route have been replaced with and reduced to the single itinerant merchant or the caravan of trucks disabled by a snowstorm. There are many cross-references to cinema. These are obvious, unlike Tolstoy's case, which uh, was different. The child names rocks and trees after movie characters and imagines them act like movie heroes. There's a legend. It's about uh, the creation of the Kyrgyz people and concerns mother dear with the rack. Uh, this is very interesting, but uh, the story takes place uh, around Isikgöl, 
on the very other end of the earth, on the furthest point of the visible, further from the sandy beaches, a lake, the center of which seemed to be swelling, was observed. Earth and sky met each other there. Beyond it was nothing. The lake shined. It was motionless and deserted. One could notice with difficulty the white foam of the waves beating the shore. And then the legend itself is told uh, uh, where uh, the deer takes the remaining two children of the Kyrgyz tribe to a new land where they will live and raise themselves and so forth. Uh, I will not go into details, but again, uh, there is an imaginary white ship. Over there on the blue, pure blue surface of the sick girl, it came sliding. Oh, the beautiful ship. The ship with a line of chimneys, long, powerful, and beautiful ship. It moved forward straight as if it was pulled with a rope. He wiped his binoculars in a hurry with his shirt and refocused. Now the lines of the ship were sharper. He could notice it swing with the waves and observe the white transparent foamy trace it left behind. He looked at it with great admiration. If only he could, he would beg it to sail nearer. Then he, he could see the people on it, but the ship knew not of him. Slowly, with great magnificence, it advanced on its way. It was impossible to know where it came from or where it headed to. He watched it for long. He kept thinking of when he would turn into a fish, jump into the stream, and swim all the way to it, which is the ending that takes place at the end. The ship, the sick girl, is represented as an immense sea, uh, and the child at one point says, where we live, weather is unpredictable. Sometimes the sky is blue, and sometimes it is black. Sometimes it rains, sometimes hail falls, everything. Now, uh, the depictions of this sick girl are really superimpositions of uh, what we know about Black Sea, its weather, its depiction, and so forth. And uh, just before we go into this last slide, I will uh, share with you a short anecdote. Uh, the book had several translations published in Turkish, and one of these translations, I think, which came out in the 70s, had as a cover picture uh, one of the Soviet cruisers uh, which operated on a regular basis in the Black Sea. Uh, so uh, whoever had read the book had really associated the imagery with its true source of inspiration. Uh, but then uh, that uh, cover disappeared from uh, future editions of the book and so forth, so this connection had been lost. I searched for it in the internet and couldn't find it. Uh, it's a pity I don't have it in my collection. Uh, but that really shows how much the imagery that uh, Aitmato carried and put on this uh, imaginary story of the white ship sailing on the Isik girl and so forth is traceable to imagery in Soviet imagination of the Black Sea cruise ship and so forth. Now, I will use this for another reason. Uh, we did not go the, into the details, but a lot of the legendary material that Aitmato presents is connectable to what I will emphasize in this last slide. Uh, we saw that in Verne's case, we are concerned with limits of human geography. We go within, we stay within the limits of human geography. Then in Tolstoy's case, we saw that it's not only characters. Uh, in Tolstoy's case, we saw characters who remember, including the author. Uh, what has happened. They rework it in the light of their experience uh, and uh, memories and so forth. Uh, but with Aitmato, we go a step further. It's legends that also remember on behalf of people. He imposes black imagery with the faraway Usuk girl, which he connects to the deer legend and so forth. It's as if nature also remembers, okay, irrespectively of this human element. Now, this I connect with something else I have discussed. Elsewhere, there is at work memory of a prehistorical, pre-ancient, paleontological sea that dried in part, and the remnants of which exist as the Black Sea, Caspian Sea, and the Aral Sea. So, this Black Sea world is really fuzzy also because it is a truncated sea in its creation, before the deluge the millions of years ago formation itself. And for this we need a post-anthropogenic 
geographical and environmental conception, some intuitive elements of which are graceable in legends, but also in literary imagination of space as we encounter in Aikmatov's novel. And here I deliberately use the word literary space because it is not a real space, but it's a superimposition which only hints to the informed reader of literature in paleontology and so forth, the material and its added meaning it can have. Thank you for your attention, patience. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Osveren. Uh, I think we still have a little time for discussion and questions uh, about your very inspiring uh, talk. So you uh, used uh, three uh, literary texts uh, to, to recreate a bigger legacy uh, space, bigger not only in the geographical terms, but uh, also in the well, historical terms. Uh, and you did uh, some deep analysis, a close reading of the text which allowed you to, to, to reconstruct such a great and marvelous picture. But maybe I, I will use my, uh, or misuse my uh, function as a chair and ask a first question. So you started your talk with the uh, distinction of the Black Sea and uh, some things that uh, you mentioned uh, hinted in the direction of the Polyphony, uh, polymorphy, maybe plurilingual. So that there are some things which, uh, uh, let's say, makes Black Sea different to the to the Mediterranean, which is a well, uh, Rodel describes it more, more unified space. So you can find this certain kind of unity also in Black Sea, but this unity is plural, which is which is a which is a not trivial thing to say. Maybe you could comment on this. Um, yes, I mean, I refer to this only uh, obliquely, uh, trying to point out the fact that scholarship about Black Sea literature is much more difficult because we don't have an established uh, academia of specialists like in Latin languages in general. Uh, with some effort, uh, someone who reads French can also uh, indulge in reading something Italian, uh, perhaps Spanish, uh, and uh, the same is true for groups of languages and for that reason, uh, but uh, currently people are discouraged to do something similar about Black Sea when they, they cannot uh, exercise this kind of proficiency in a multitude of languages and uh, the ethics of scholarship, which I do not necessarily share, requires that you only talk about things you know 100% are correct. I don't share that ethic, not because I take ethics lightly, but because we are never 100% correct anyway. Uh, so uh, we should not give ourselves that much credit, and therefore we can also indulge in speculation when necessary. So I think this is important. The polyphony I trace through the text what they, but we couldn't go through details of it in the writing, uh, uh, but it is there. Uh, so uh, it's a pity it deserves studying much more carefully across the languages, but at the same time those people with the virtuosity of multiple languages is rapidly uh, being extinguished because there are fewer and fewer people who learn these languages. And this is one reason why, by default, national literature becomes the paradigm in which literary scholars work, uh, because they know their language. And we seem to think that things are far more apart than they are. Uh, they have their similars elsewhere. This is why I wanted to use three very different texts from very different uh, literary traditions, uh, quality of literary artifacts, etc. Uh, to show that they can be complementary. There is a circulation of themes and material in them uh, that adds up to a picture greater than the one we find in any of them, which I referred to. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, any questions? Uh, maybe I will allow myself.
myself to ask uh, one uh, more question. Uh, uh, so you, you, this text, uh, Aitmatov's text, was uh, extremely interesting, but uh, there is still some kind of maritime, uh, maritime uh, images in this white ship, which is uh, this alternative version of the second ending, <laughs> maybe <coughs> something which. Uh, which is uh, which plays this role uh, of rescuing uh, rescuing the main figures, but uh, the the maritime uh, imagery is in my memory completely ex absent in, in Haji Murat, right? So it's uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, so how how can you or it, it, it doesn't play obviously an important role for you when you uh, when you when you uh, talk about the literary space of the fantasy. Absolutely. Uh, it's uh, precisely, it's a follow-up on what I quoted from Bern, really. Uh, he said, within an hour or so, we had lost track of the shore. Uh, now, this is, given the technology of the time, uh, a very short distance uh, where the uh, characters in Kerevan Letutu took the turn of the coast. Uh, and you are in an entirely different world as soon as that happens. But at the same time, uh, I could not go into the details of Haji Murat, but in the specifications of the interaction of Russian and local cultures, especially uh, Tartar-related cultures as they are presented in the book, uh, is very much representative of the story in the steppe in general and in other parts where uh, they were much more infused with the effect of the sea than was the case in the higher Caucasus. Yes, yes definitely, and uh, the Russian uh, colonial politics or imperial mm -hmm. politics, uh, has, uh, which Tolstoy bears in mind when he writes that Shemurat has this, uh, also these maritime histories of, of uh, Mohajirat, of uh, Cherkes and Abkhaz, of course, which yes. is not, not maybe not literally mentioned, but, uh, but yes. maybe present there as well. Yes.